Hello class, we're continuing our discussion of sex differences in the brain from our lecture on Friday. Before we left, I introduced this specific paper here, Sex Differences in Context Fear Generalization and Recruitment of Hippocampus and Amygdala During Retrieval. There's a lot of jargon there having to do with learning and memory, um, but let's uh, sort of ignore that for now and get into it. First, if you remember, I introduced, I introduced fear conditioning which is this um, paradigm that's been used in psychology and neuroscience for close to 50 years. It's used to investigate uh, largely learning and memory. And it's been developed in uh, laboratory rodent models. And this is how it works. It uses classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning in which an individual is exposed to something that is inherently noxious or or something that, that elicits an innate fear-like response, such as a foot shock. That fear response in rodents is to freeze. And this is paired with another stimulus that is neutral, something that does not elicit an inherent fear response in rats. In this illustrative example, that neutral stimulus is the blue box. So a rodent is picked up out of its cage and put into a blue box and it is given a foot shock, right? So, so it, it associates this foot shock with the blue box. When you put the rat in subsequent trials, when you put the rat in, back into the blue box and you don't give it a foot shock, it will exhibit a fear response because it's associated this novel blue environment with the foot shock. Now, in this paradigm, um, one thing you might be interested in investigating is how, how well they discriminate or generalize between similar um, inherently non-noxious uh, uh, stimuli. And so we can see two possible outcomes here. Perhaps the rat, the rat has formed a very um, specific association with the foot shock in this novel environment. And so if you were to put it into a similar environment, but slightly different, in this case, it's purple, not blue, they won't show a fear response because they have discriminated between the blue and the purple boxes. Though if a rat has generalized its fear response, and it really doesn't tell the difference between the blue or the purple and recognizes it, um, recognizes it as uh, an environment that is associated with the foot, the uh, foot shock, then this rat will show a similar fear-like response, i.e. it'll free just, freeze just as much. Uh, so when researchers put rats or mice through this protocol, it's as simple as just measuring how much time they freeze and then comparing that time between and among different groups or different trials of the same rat. So if you put the rat in a purple box and it freezes much, much less, then you would say that that rat has discriminated between the blue and the purple box. But if that rat, you put it in a purple box and it freezes just as much as it had when it was in the blue box, then you would say that this rat has generalized its fear response. It doesn't have a really specific, tight memory of foot shock, or blue box equals foot shock. It might be something to sort of give it a bit of a, a narrative to make it easier to understand. Perhaps in the rat's brain, they're thinking, well, I remember being put in this this really strange box and, and it kind of had a kind of, kind of a darker color, a lot different than what I'm used to. They might not distinguish between, um, you know, various colors. Whereas this rat on top, perhaps they have this internal narrative of, I, I remember that box. It was the blue box. It's the blue box that shocks me. 
the purple box. I, I have no idea what this is. I have no reason to be afraid of the purple box because it is not the blue box, right? To sort of, I'm not suggesting that these rats have this internal voice where they're talking to themselves in um, perfect English, um, but just to illustrate um, the, the, the thinking behind what discrimination means and what generalization means. So let's take a look at this study and some of the results that they found. So when they do this and we, they compare um, between female rats and male rats, they, they see some differences in their behavior. Female rats on average freeze for longer. So they say they have a stronger, they, would, they interpret that as they have a stronger fear response. So this is simply um, looking at what they do in the blue boxes right here. And we can see over here on this chart, here's percent freezing. How much time do they spend freezing? Um, so they may measure them for, for like four minutes after putting them in the blue box. This is after they've been conditioned um, to blue box equals foot shock. And so they may put, they, they put them into this box 24 hours after they've gotten the, the uh, foot shock in that box and they put it back in the blue box. And they say, how much time do you spend frozen in four minutes? And so for females, um, I'm looking at this blue bar, which, which corresponds with the blue box. They freeze for about over 60% of the time, whereas males, it looks like it's 45% of the time. And this difference is significant between the sexes, statistically speaking. Um, so they say that the, um, they interpret it as, as females have a stronger fear response. Now also, they measure differences in males and females in their their reaction to the purple box. And so they'll put them into a purple box and measure their, their fear response. And they see that males exhibit less generalization um, or the flip side of that coin, you could also describe it as um, they're more discriminatory between the two stimuli. We can see that reflected here as well. So here's the bar for the purple boxes. The females are approaching about 55%. And so the difference between the, this um, just over 60% and 55% is not statistically significant. And these little bars here represent the error. You know, not all females are freezing for 60% of the time. There's a range. 60% is the average. And the same for the, the purple bar. And so there's, there's no statistical difference between how long they freeze between the blue box and the purple box. However, when we look at males, there is a significant difference between how long they freeze when you put them in the blue box versus the purple box. Looks like about 45% of the time in the blue box and roughly 25% of the time or a little bit more when you put them in the purple box. And it's quite comparable to this white bar here and that's a control. So that's simply picking up the rat and putting it back down in its home cage. How long does it freeze? So when you put a male rat, and you pick them up out of their home cage and you put them in this new purple box, they freeze just as much as if you just pick them up in their home cage and put them back down. All right, so they don't see that as, they, they, they don't, um, they don't, they're not, um, they don't exhibit a fear response any different from if you just pick them up where they live in their home, their home cage. But we can contrast this to females. It's quite a stark difference. If you pick them up and put them down in their home cage, it's pretty comparable to the males. Right? So presumably this, this isn't eliciting much of a fear response. However, if you pick up the females and put them in the purple cage, they nearly double the amount of time that they freeze. So these results are interpreted uh, in that females are showing a generalized response because they are not, they can't, they're not discriminating between blue and purple boxes. Even though it was just the blue box that they got shocked in, they seem to be treating the purple boxes as if they got shocked in it. So they've generalized their fear response. Whereas the males, they're only showing a significant fear response on the blue box and the blue box only. They're not showing uh, a fear response with the purple box. So they have discriminated between these two stimuli. And to go one step further, um, 
uh, these extra bars here are showing a similar pattern. Uh, the only difference is, is that they've switched up the order uh, uh, in which the, the rats were presented to the blue box or the purple box to see if that made a difference. And so for these individuals, they were always put into the purple box first and then the blue box. And the first ones I showed you, it was reverse, blue box first, then purple. And you don't have to worry about that too much, but this is sort of an important statistical um, and experimental design uh, uh, measure to take to make sure that you can trust your results and to rule out other possible explanations. And this is pretty standard in these types of laboratory experiments. Um, and another way to represent the data um, they sort of taken the, the numbers of the percent freezing and, and comparing them between the blue box and the purple box to get what they call a discrimination score. And we can see that the, the higher you are on this y-axis, um, the, the more you discriminate between the two stimuli. So we can see pretty clearly that males are discriminating much more between the blue box and the purple box. So for these rats, there seems to be a sex-specific difference in their fear response. The degree of their fear response, if you remember the females, they're, both the blue and purple bars are significantly higher than the males' blue and purple bars. But beyond that, um, males are discriminating more. Females are generalizing more. And so beyond the behavior, Let's take a look at sort of the proximate, um, sort of the, the, the proximate mechanism that might be contributing to this, this sex bias difference in behavior. So let me introduce CFOS to you. This is a gene and it's used, it's, it's a standard measure used in neuroscience to measure neural activity in general. So CFOS is, an, is what's considered an immediate early gene it's activated very quickly um, for a short period of time in a wide variety of cellular stimuli, not just in the nervous system, um, but it's used to look at activity in neurons. All right, so any time a cell um, sort of um, uh, it changes in some way in its metabolism and its activity, CFOS is one of these early genes that gets turned on um, and you sort of get a quick burst uh, of CFOS activity. And it's one of these genes that produces uh, a protein that just has tons of downstream effects. It, it, it's, it's used in the early processes of a lot of different um, metabolic, cellular metabolic processes. And so, like I said, it's an indirect marker of neural activity. And um, um, specifically, it's used because it, you get a really quick burst of it in response to a neuron firing. So whenever a neuron fires, whenever it, 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 um, it sends out an action potential, um, you, you get this transcription burst of CFOS. So it's sort of an indirect, it's a proxy for neurons firing, right? Um, and so the presence of CFOS indicates neurons are turning on and being used, to put it very simply. And so let's take a look here at this, um, this imaging of part of the hippocampus here. And so here's the, uh, a wide shot in this little box right here is uh, the close-up, or this screen here, let me get my little red pointer, this screen here is the uh, this box inset, so we're zooming in. And so the blue stains are just simply the neurons, it's staining the neurons, and the green is staining the CFOS, All right, so specifically it's targeting the CFOS RNA, which is that transcription step from DNA to RNA and then ultimately protein. So we're measuring the amount of RNA. All right, so that's a, a direct output from gene transcription. And so we can see um, all the green here, okay? And, and so we're, we're looking at two different, um, uh, two different 
uh, examples here of when CFOS is turned on and when it's not. And then the bottom here, they've simply overlaid the two so you can see the association between the CFOS and the specific neurons. Um, but the point here is just to illustrate um, that you can actually visualize CFOS and you can quantify how much CFOS there is by um, looking at what percent of cells have CFOS activated in, in imaging like this. And so that's what they did in this study. They, they took a look at um, uh, slices of the hippocampus to look for CFOS neural activity. And so we have two different CA1 and CA3 or two different parts of the hippocampus that they looked at. Um, and the hippocampus is an important section of the brain from the perspective of learning and memory. Specifically, it's very important for um, consolidating memory. So from when you encode new information in your environment, you, you have it in your brain in, in short-term memory form. And if you were to hold on to this, it needs to be transformed into a long-term memory. And this is what the hippocampus does. It helps to consolidate new information from a short-term um, uh, a short-term memory into a long-term memory. We can take a look here and see, um, looking at both of these two sections of the hippocampus, that males have higher CFOS activation during memory retrieval. And so the y-axis here is CFOS um, looking at the relative difference between um, cells for the hippocampus, sort of a snapshot during memory retrieval. So that would be when they, the, these rats have already been exposed to the blue box and the foot shock. And then a day later, they're lifted up and they're put into the blue box. And so if they have good memory, if their memory has been consolidated, they're going to remember that the last time they were in that blue box, they got a foot shock, and they'll exhibit a fear-like response. Let's say that they've, the, they have uh, an inability to form long-term memories. If you put them in that blue box a day later, they will have completely forgotten about the foot shock. So they shouldn't show a fear response. And so... When we take a look at CFOS activity between females and males, we see that the males over here, whether or not it's the blue box, um, or, or uh, regardless of what order they're put into the, to the box, um, uh, the, the blue or the purple, um, they're showing the same amount of CFOS activity or, or, or similar amounts, and they're both significantly higher than the CFOS activity that the females exhibit. And it's the same for, for this part of the hippocampus, the CA3 section and then the CA1 section. The males are exhibiting um, relatively higher amounts of CFOS activity. So more neurons are firing in the hippocampus when they're put into the blue box or the purple box. And this is what you would expect if, um, if they have higher discrimination between the two. So to put it very, very simply, the more CFOS, i.e. the more neurons you have firing in your hippocampus, your hippocampus is, is sort of uh, um, uh, working to a higher degree, you should expect to see more discrimination in the behavior. They have a, they, they have a better memory of that initial association. So if you have a better memory of that initial blue box foot shock, um, you should expect them to be able to discriminate between the colors, um, and you should expect that their hippocampus is working over time. And this is what we see. They also took a look at neuroactivity in the amygdala. And so the basal amyg amygdala, BA here, this is important in fear context conditioning and fear generalization. And so if an individual were to show a more extreme fear response and or generalize their fear response to other stimuli, you should expect to see their amygdala 
working overtime relative to individuals that don't exhibit that type of behavior. And so females, not surprisingly, show higher CFOS activity during memory retrieval. So 24 hours later, when they're put into a blue box or put into a purple box, their amygdala is working overtime relative to the male's amygdala. And this makes sense based on what we see in their behavior. They're showing a more extreme fear response and they're generalizing their fear response. So let's take, a, let's take this one step further and look at the mechanisms of um, differences in the sex, differences between uh, male and female sexes and rodents, and this difference in, in uh, hippocampus and um, or I'm sorry, a uh, difference in uh, the basolateral amygdala activity. So this relatively recent paper, yeah, three years old now, sex-dependent regulation of aromatase-mediated synaptic plasticity in the basolateral amygdala. What does that mean? Let's take a look. So we're looking at the amygdala again. We're not looking at CFOS anymore. We're looking at the number of synapses per 10 micrometers uh, cubed, so a volume. All right, so they've, they've, they've dissected out the amygdala and they're taking a look at how many little processes are off of the axons uh, in the dendrites of the amygdala. And before, remember in class, we talked about this and also in the last asynchronous lecture, the more synapses you have on a neuron, the more connections it can make. So we see, well first let me introduce um, a little bit of background information. So estradiol, we've discussed this before, um, it can increase synaptic connections among neurons. So it starts um, a cascade of events starting with transcription of certain genes that that eventually carry down to um, to a neuron growing more synaptic connections. So estradiol initiates that growth. And this process, th th this process appears to be sex dependent. And so how do we know that? So aromatase, if you remember, that's the, that's the protein, the enzyme that you need to get estradiol. If you don't have aromatase, you can't make estradiol because estradiol comes from the, the precursor to estradiol's testosterone. And so you must con convert, you must convert testosterone into estradiol using aromatase. And so uh, letrozole is a pharmacological way to block aromatase. So it's uh, 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 a drug that you can inject and it will sort of, it'll, it'll co-opt um, aromatase. It won't let testosterone uh, bind to it. And so if you inject letrozole, it will reduce synapses, synapse density in the amygdala, but only, interestingly, for female mice. And so we see here already, um, uh, the, the x-axis here, let me familiarize yourself with it, a vehicle means this is the sham or the control, like any good experimental design, you need the control. And so rats are injected usually with saline solution. They're injected with something, um, just not the drug, something benign. Or they're injected with this uh, letrozole, this aromatase blocker. Right. And this is important, right, because if you didn't inject a control group, the differences you saw between groups, how would you know that they were due to the drug itself? Maybe they would be due just to being stuck with a needle, because that's somewhat invasive. So you have to control, with, control for that. Both of these groups have been stuck with a needle and injected with a liquid. The only difference is, is that this liquid blocks aromatase. This liquid is benign, it does nothing. So when you inject a rat with saline solution, they have a certain level, they have a certain density of synapses. And it's, it, it's, it's significantly more dense than males. And we, we, we talked about this before. Um, 
this is uh, th this is true. This is a uh, um, uh, for certain parts of the rodent brain, uh, females have a higher density of synapses. They have a more tightly, um, densely networked areas of the brain. Um, when you inject them with this drug that that prevents them from making estradiol, that density dramatically drops. When you do that to males, it, it doesn't have a significant difference. And in fact, the, the, the group that got the aromatase blocker actually went up, albeit th this difference is within that realm of error, right? So statistically, there's, we can't be confident that this difference um, really reflects reality. So we would say that there's, that there's no significant difference between these groups. So this aromatase blocker seems to dramatically affect female mice, but not male mice. So there's a, a, a difference in how aromatase seems to be functioning, or, or the difference in how aromatase functions in the synaptic, sim, the synaptic density of your amygdala depends on what sex you are, if you're a rat. And to take this one step further, um, they also took a look in the study at their neural activity. And so another graph that might be hard to digest here. All right, so let's, let's walk through it one step at a time here. So first, let me introduce long-term potentiation. So this is, this is simply the strengthening of a synapsis between neurons. So your neurons are connected in your brain um, your memory, different specific memories, are really just um, uh, um, connections between neurons. A really strong memory has a much stronger connection uh, among neurons. So memory is associated with a specific network of neurons. And if it's a really strong memory that you're not going to forget, those connections are really, really strong. And so we call this long-term potentiation. Right, that's a type of strengthening of connections in your neurons. Um, and, and LTP is characterized by excitatory postsynaptic potentials. All that means is that, think of it as your neurons have more of a hair trigger of being fired. So having a really strong connection means that, you're, that the neurons are more likely to induce an action of potential. It takes less stimulus for them to turn on and send information. So if you have a network of, of neurons that are really, uh, that, have, that, that have a high degree of LTP, that means that they're gonna, they're gonna fire like, like crazy with, with little stimulus. All right, so you can, you can think about this as like, this is something that uh, like a really hard grain memory that you've had since childhood, for example, that, that you'll never forget, you know, like I will never forget my childhood house phone number, right? When you guys maybe are too young to even have grown up with a landline, but you know, I had a house where there was a landline and we had our house phone number and I had to memorize it. Now I'm never going to forget it because I have a really strong, among other things, LTP in that network of neurons that remember that, and they just fire like crazy. Um, on the other hand, think about something that's been, maybe something that's really hard for you to remember. Maybe it's you know something on a test uh, that you've taken recently, or um, you know, have you ever had that experience when, like, oh man, it's so, like it's on the tip of your tongue and. Like what is what is that actor's name or when what year was it when I when that thing happened? Oh I can't remember. Oh what is it? And you just can't get it out. You can't get that memory. So that's an example of the network of neurons that are associated with that information that you're trying to get. They they haven't quite reached that level of stimulus needed to to fire. If that makes sense. Right? So they their, their excitatory postsynaptic potential is less. They haven't fired yet. And that's why, that's why you can't quite remember all the information that you need. 
because those neurons, their connections are weaker and they're just not, you can't get those action potentials to fire because the threshold to get them to fire is, is more demanding. And so that, that's what this graph represents here. So we're looking at time in minutes. So over the course of two hours here, they're measuring, they're measuring this excitatory postsynaptic potential, right? EPSP. And that's what, so the higher, the higher the EPSP is, think of that as um, they're more likely to fire. Right, they, they have more of a, a hair trigger because it doesn't take as much stimulus for them to, to cause action potentials. And so what they've done here is that they've injected at time zero, they injected, um, fem let's see, I'm kind of covering up a bit of the information. There we go. They've injected females and males with letrozole. So they're not gonna be able to make estradiol. Right. And estradiol is um, important for increasing synap synaptic connections between neurons. And if you want really strong long-term potentiation, if you want to um, increase the excitatory postsynaptic potential of your neurons, if you want to give them that hair trigger, what do you need to do? You need to increase the number of synaptic connections between your neurons. You need to make them have more physical connections. And what does that? Well, we've learned that estradiol does that. We're going to block estradiol from that, and we're going to see how that affects this process of long-term potentiation. So we've already seen that in females, estradiol prevents synaptic density. So we might make a prediction that, well, if we're going to block it here, and that's going to prevent synaptic density, and those synap synapses, an increase in those synapses is how you get to long-term potentiation, or we shouldn't see it. And so they measured for a while, and then they give the neurons a stimulus, um, a high-frequency stimulus. That's what AFS is, right here at an hour. And so that stimulus should um, sort of give you the, the start, the, the stimulus that you need to increase synaptic density. We can see in females, it stays relatively level. Even after this high frequency stimulus, uh, we don't see that. Oh, and I should say that this is being done and measured in a Petri dish, right? So these are neurons um, outside of the animal, in vitro. And down here, we'll take a look at the males. Despite the fact that their aromatase has been blocked, they actually see an increase, especially after this high frequency stimulus in long-term potentiation. So again, here's another process that's, that's differing between the two sexes, where long-term potentiation, even though this is a process that, that happens um, in both males and females, aromatase, that enzyme that gives you estradiol seems much less important in males than it does in females. So in these rodent brains, before you know the, the beginning of our near the beginning of our class lecture, we took a look at in humans how the, they're really after you correct for body size, right? There really is no difference in the size of the amygdala between males and females, humans. Um, um, and that's, that's the case for rodents as well. But we see there's more than just size that matters. Um, we can see here in the, the, the activity of the neurons in the, the amygdala matter as well. And we see some, um, some pretty uh, significant differences between male and females in their proximate mechanisms, and then also those downstream behavioral outcomes, like showing a more intense fear response uh, generalizing fear or discriminating between stimuli that induce that fear response. So when we uh, reconvene in class on Tuesday, I'm going to be discussing some differences um, specifically in humans, some more in our, um, some, some differences uh, between the sexes in 
um, in, in cognitive processes. And so humans are rather, are, are somewhat unique in the animal kingdom, right? Which isn't, that's, that's not a groundbreaking statement. And that's largely due to our large cortex. That's the part of the brain that you think of when you think of brain. It's the real wrinkly part. It's on top, up front here, it's over here. It's why our heads are so big relative to our body, relative to other mammals. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, characteristics that that part of our brain give rise to. And we're going to be looking closely to see are there differences between um, the, the conventional sexes, male and female, if there's differences there. And we're going to be taking a look at some more meta-analyses that bring together a bunch of information over time. And we're going to see if we can get down to the bottom um, of things like mathematical ability, um, um, uh, uh, what else will we look at? Uh, intelligence, maybe, um, which is a really hard thing to measure. Um, uh, uh, social, let's see, what's the term? We'll take a look at, um, I'm going to say social maturity, but that's not quite the, uh, the, the term that I'm, that I'm looking at, that I'm looking for. Well, anyway, regardless, we'll take, a, we'll take a look at a number of different features that are somewhat unique to humans, and we'll see if there's a difference between the sexes. Uh, and then we'll also take a look at some relatively um, kind of relatively new, but also um, kind of, I don't want to say preliminary because they're robust uh, research papers, um, but, but uh, limited data. Um, that's a good way to put it. Limited, relatively new, limited data about about um, the neural mechanisms of uh, individuals that, that identify as transgender to see if are their brains different in, and in what way, if they are at all. Um, so some very interesting research that's sort of going beyond the, the normal male-female binary that, that's you know, been studied ever since neuroscience has been studied. Okay, so I'll see you on class on Tuesday. Enjoy the rest of the weekend.